Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Climate Change AI se webinar series. Um, I'm Marcus Voss, and I'm part of the Climate Change AI team. Um, I'm a community lead chair there, so I'm a community lead for buildings and uh, transport at CCAI. In my day job, I'm an AI expert consultant um, for applications in sustainability at a small consultancy called Birds on Mars, based in Berlin. Um, for those who haven't uh, yeah, attended any of the events from Climate Change AI, just a brief recap. Um, so we are an initiative that fosters impactful work at the intersection of climate change and machine learning uh, by providing education and infrastructure, uh, by community building and advancing discourse in this area. So, I mean, this format, for example, I guess falls in between education and community building. We um, conduct various initiatives. Um, so, you may know our digital resources, um, for example, um, our um, wiki and uh, the papers that have submitted to our uh, to our workshop series before. Um, there's the workshop series, the summer school. There's formats like um, the grant program where we actually offer also research grants that you may apply to in the future. Um, there's the community, community platform circle, uh, the newsletter, the blog, and more webinars and meetups like this format, for example. Just uh, some of the examples. Um, so this is our community platform, Circle. Um, so this is a great format um, that you could go to and connect with people that are interested in various fields of the application of machine learning in the climate space. Um, so if you haven't, go there. And another great research is our uh, resource is our blog. So this is where you can um, get informed on a wide range of topics, um, some research applications, some presentations from the team, and many more. Also, if you have a topic uh, that you want to share, um, yeah, reach out to us and maybe you can also write your blog article. Then there's the newsletter. Um, this is one of the uh, great resources also at CCAI. It's a monthly newsletter with a lot of jobs and uh, funding opportunities and conferences and so on. Um, yeah, but today uh, we are on this webinar. And so the timetable is this introduction that goes roughly yeah, one more minute. And then we have um, Angel Sue's presentation that will be roughly 45 minutes. And then there's going to be 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. So for, regarding the questions, please go to Slido. So this is where you can um, go um, following this QR code or following the link in the YouTube uh, stream. And there you can ask the questions, vote on other questions. Um, also have a look if, if your question is maybe already there. And um, the questions which are favored the most um, are the ones that we're going to ask in the end. But without further ado, um, let's introduce our speaker. So I'm going to read this part. Uh, so Adrian Sue is an assistant professor um, of public policy and the env environment at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She is the founder and director of the Data-Driven EnviroLab, an interdisciplinary research group that applies data-driven approaches to pressing environmental issues. She was a contributing author to the IPCC sixth assessments report and was a lead author of the 2018 UNEP emissions gap report, a special chapter on non-state and subnational actors. She holds a PhD in environmental policy from Yale University and was, a, uh, was formerly an assistant professor in environmental studies at Yale and US College in Singapore. And this is, I guess, where you are right now, also in Singapore. Um, so that's, right. and that's uh, where I'm handing over to now. Thank you so much, Marcus. And thanks so much to Arthur and David and the whole climate change AI community for inviting me to give this webinar. I have really benefited from being part of this community and seeing them at the COP events and participating in the summer school and webinar. So I'm super excited to have this opportunity to share my work. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully you can see my slides okay. Uh, I guess Marcus or Arthur, if it's not showing up, please let me know. So um, I am not a computer scientist, as Marcus said in this introduction. And um, I, my background is very interdisciplinary in nature. So I studied biology and political science as an undergrad. And then my first job out of grad school was working at the World Resources Institute at the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, where that's when I really understood the value of data for environmental policy. So the mantra that we always use was you can't manage what you don't measure and you can't manage well what you don't measure well. 
So we were involved in developing these tools for businesses and organizations to account for their greenhouse gas emissions. And I was particularly working with developing countries, um, Mexico, Brazil, China, India, the Philippines, to develop voluntary accounting and reporting programs. And that's where I really saw the value of these bottom-up approaches. So engaging private businesses and subnational governments to help to tackle climate change. And so um, then I went back to grad school and did my PhD, wanting to combine tools of data science and statistics, geography, so using satellite remote sensing data in a policy context. So uh, I, I kind of resist labels in that way. And everyone's always asking me, well, what do you, what, what exactly are you? And um, I'm, I consider myself an interdisciplinary social scientist that leverages these tools in machine learning. So I'm super excited to be um, telling you about some of the work that we do at the Data Driven Lab to actually apply machine learning and some of these techniques that originated in other, other disciplines, including computer science, to help us better evaluate the impact of climate policies and how climate change is affecting different populations in different ways. So today in this very short 45 minutes, I wanna give you three examples of how we're using machine learning in climate change policy. The first one is looking at how we are using machine learning to fill in gaps in emissions data that we desperately need to understand our policies that we apply to address climate change actually working and helping to reduce emissions. And we're doing that on a subnational scale. And then still focus on cities, I wanna talk about how we're using machine learning to get a better uh, set of measures to evaluate heat impacts in urban areas. And then lastly, I wanna talk about some of the work where we're using some emerging text analysis uh, tools. So you may be familiar with structured topic modeling or LDA, which is also a type of unsupervised machine learning applied to text data. But then I also wanna talk about how we're now leveraging large language models to understand the credibility and the robustness of climate policy commitments. So that's what I'm gonna to hope to do in this next uh, for short 40 minutes. Okay, but first I wanna give you a little bit of background on why I'm so interested in these bottom-up approaches to climate change and why so much of my work has tried to involve private businesses and some national governments. So this is some data that I put together. You can get this from the Global Carbon Project, fantastic data source if you're trying to find some basic data on what is the status of global climate change, particularly with respect to total annual emissions. So this is million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent and you can see that since this data record started in 1950, and then this is all the way up until around 2020, emissions have continued to go up. And here on this figure, I have marked some of the key moments in global climate change and science policy to, uh, to, that have emerged to tackle and to address the global problem of climate change. So you can see the first assessment report of the IPCC came out around 1990. And that's when governments all across the world came together and uh, nominated scientists to sift through all of the climate science and all the literature to establish what is the scientific basis of climate change. And that's formed a lot of our current understanding of the issue. And after that, governments decided to get together and they went to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil in the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. And then they came up with a bunch of different environmental conventions, including the UNFCCC. And there's a lot of alphabet soup in policy. So feel free on the Slido or ping me uh, if you're not sure if one of these um, acronyms is making sense. So the UNFCCC, this is the framework convention. And that's when governments came together to tackle climate change on a multilateral basis and develop the Kyoto Protocol, which is still the only legally binding climate agreement. And um, that's, that's when governments, particularly focused um, on the EU and the OECD countries, decided that they were going to set emissions limits to reduce their emissions by a certain time frame. And since then, we've had more IPCC reports, we've had more COP meetings, so annual conference of parties that bring together different parties. Uh, most notably, 2015 was COP21. That was the Paris Agreement that kind of shifted this whole top-down architecture of global climate policy on its head, recognizing that we need to have an all hands on deck approach. We need to have businesses and subnational governments also engaged. And then shortly after I was actually at the next COP in Marrakesh in 2016, during the US election when Trump uh, won president and there was just kind of a um, movement in the, in the COP and everyone was moving from the US and trying to see what China was doing there. And then um, of course the only 
drop in emissions that we've seen, it was during the COVID-19 pandemic where the model showed that emissions dropped by about a median of seven and a half percent. And that was the largest drop that we've ever seen. And so looking at this data and looking at the various efforts that we've taken on a global scale to try to coordinate action um, in the social sciences, um, when we started to tackle climate change, there was a theory of collective action. And this was really, I think, the underpinned and premise a lot of our design of the mechanisms and the ways that we design the architecture for, for tackling climate change on a global scale. And so you may have heard of um, Garrett Hardin and talking about the tragedy of the commons where he talks about this cow pasture and it being overrun um, if you don't assign property rights and don't tell people when they can actually graze their cattle on this common resource. And so that analogy has been applied to the global commons of the atmosphere. And so um, what this theory suggests is that um, actors, they, they wanna seek short-term material gain. They're self-interested. So they have no incentive to actually bear the individual costs of addressing climate change. And so as a result, you get a lot of free riding. And so when governments came together in 1992 to start to articulate this UNFCCC and the first agreement to tackle climate change, this was the dominant worldview and the framing that they took when deciding to design instruments like targets uh, that could limit e emissions from OECD countries or uh, developing these market mechanisms to try to incentivize actors to wanna do the right thing on climate change. But um, again, going back to the data, we can see that since these frameworks were conceptualized and implemented, emissions have continued to rise. And this is from the latest UN Environment Program Emissions Gap Report. It's an annual stock take. They've now done, I think, 11 or 12 of these that take stock of current national government policies. You can see that here in blue and where the scientific models tell us we need to get by way of global annual emissions. So this y-axis is global annual emissions of carbon dioxide equivalent. So you can see in red, this is where we need to go if we wanna have any chance of, cont of containing global temperature rise 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And so the current um, policies, this is basically kind of the, the worst case scenario, uh, current policies in blue. And then if we take into consideration the conditional statements, because a lot of governments, they say, well, I could do this by way of reducing my emissions, but if I had additional financing and technology, then I could probably get to this orange scenario here. But despite all of these scenarios and the different ways that we look at modeling the impact of these national government policies, we can see that there, that still leaves a 20 to 23 annual gigaton gap between the best case national government scenario and where we need emissions to go if we wanna keep that 1.5 degrees Celsius goal within reach. So that is what is referred to as the emissions gap. And so where my work really comes in is, okay, clearly we're heading in the, in the wrong direction. And frankly, I don't think national governments are up to the task of achieving the needed emissions reductions that are required for us to avoid the most dangerous impacts of climate change. And that's where we get this 1.5 degrees Celsius target where scientists have agreed that this is the threshold by which we're going to start to see, and we're already experiencing, and I'll get to that in my second example, but we're already experiencing the impacts of climate change all around the world in terms of increased temperatures, more prolonged and frequent extreme heat events, wildfires. I mean, I think about the, the disaster in Maui that happened. My friend lost her home. Uh, and then also continued um, flooding events, coastal flooding in particular, and more extreme weather events. These are all impacts of climate change that we now see more and more commonplace. And so this is where my work really comes in to ask, well, given the fact that national governments currently are not producing the action that we need, can non-state actors, so this is including cities and regional governments like the state of California or businesses like Walmart and Amazon and Google, can they actually act to fill in the gap? And so at the same time, we see that global emissions have been rising. At the same time, we actually see growing participation of these non-state actors in the global climate policy conversations. So here on the left, I've compiled data from the UNFCCC COP participation. And you can see that over time, we've seen an increasing diversity in the types of non-state civil society and private actors, industry coalitions, indigenous groups that have been participating in these, in these conferences. And then on the right, this is pulled from that special chapter that I was the lead author of for the UNEP Gap Report in 2018. We can see that many of these non-state actors are working together in what we call international cooperative initiatives. And that's 
um, that's when they come together and they set a particular goal, such as RE100, we're going to commit to consume 100% renewable electricity by 2050. Or the UN Framework Convention, they have a race to zero campaign where they're trying to galvanize different actors to establish net zero or decarbonization goals by mid-century or sooner. And so following along this timeline, we can see that in 2015, and leading before that, there was a huge push, particularly by the UN Secretary General, to orchestrate or to coordinate a lot of these non-state actors to work together to tackle climate change. And there's a lot of theories in the social science literatures that I work with that try to explain this phenomenon and what the function and the roles are, but I'm not going to get too deep into that. I just basically want to show the evolution of the rise of these non-state actors on the global policy space. And so this was in 2015. You have Harris Mayor Anne Hidalgo, former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg, they came together at the 2015 Conference of Parties, the COP event in Paris. This was remarkable to see. I think this was probably one of the most exciting COPs I've been to. And it was because they had three COPs going on simultaneously. You had the Blue Zone COP, which was the national government, those, th those negotiations. But then you also had a separate conversation for subnational governments and a separate negotiation also for Fortune 500 CEOs and the business community. So there was a lot of activity. Everybody was there. They were really committed, wanting to raise the ambition of the Paris Agreement and wanting to demonstrate, you can see the support of all these mayors and governors that came to Paris. They wanted to support the most ambitious Paris Agreement possible. And much to my surprise, these actors were officially recognized in the text of the Paris Agreement itself. So this is a quote from the Paris Agreement, and it says that parties, this is what all parties that sign on to the Paris Accord agree to, they recognize the importance of the engagement of all levels of government and various actors. And that was officially enshrined in the, in the text of the Paris Agreement. And it aligned with this new ratchet mechanism that was introduced in the Paris Agreement itself. So remember that the Kyoto Protocol, the only legally binding agreement, had this top-down structure. So they had everyone agree to these targets, reduce emissions 20% from 2005 levels by 2020 or something along those lines. But because they wanted to secure action from everyone, no matter if you are the UK or you're Germany or you're China or India or Brazil, everybody has to do something on climate change. Everybody has to put forth an NDC or a nationally determined contribution that said what they were going to do on climate change adaptation, mitigation, and financing. And the idea is that every five years in the Paris Agreement's review cycles, you would then see what everyone is doing. And actually, we're just finishing up this global stock take process now. So this upcoming COP28, which will be held in Dubai, will be really, really critical because then parties or national governments would have received the results of this two-year process that we've just completed to really understand what national governments have pledged and also what subnational actors and private actors have pledged to feed into these virtuous cycles. So the idea that we can have, use the data, we can have the analysis, understand what everybody has contributed, and then governments should be able to ratchet up the ambition of that NDC so that we can get closer to closer to narrowing that emissions gap. And so that's really where my work um, is situated. I don't know if I can actually get the um, annotate to work here. Yeah, I'm just, I'm not even gonna try. As you can tell, I actually didn't do any teaching remotely during the pandemic. I actually stayed in Singapore and, and managed to remain unscathed. So I, my Zoom skills are not that good. So I'll just, just say this is really the backdrop and the background to where these, these three case studies and why I'm so interested in what on the left here, the subnational non-state actors are doing and what they can contribute to climate change. And that's really where I see the value of AI coming in. And I'll explain that with my first case study, which is on emissions prediction. So the policy challenge here is the fact that many of these actors, despite these really nice theories that I've just presented, the fact that they got enshrined into the Paris Accord, they're doing all this work together in these international cooperative initiatives. The main challenge is that we actually lack data. The whole Paris Agreement rests on data and transparency. So the fact that not just national governments, but we also need businesses and subnational actors to contribute data. They need to report on what they're doing, what their annual emissions are. Are they actually making progress? What policies and actions are they implementing to achieve those goals? We need information on all of that so that we understand whether or not this ratchet mechanism, these virtuous cycles are actually happening. So what we found in our research is that many of these actors are actually not reporting data. 
So this is a database that we put together. It's publicly available. You can get it on GitHub. We've also built it into an R package, cleverly called Climactor. And we also include several different cleaning functions. If you have ever done any data science, and I tell all of my data science students this, data science is really 99% data janitorial work. And uh, so we've actually cut out a lot of the hard work that you might need in wanting to just merge together country level data sets or even city level data sets. And we also include a lot of just base contextual data that you might wanna know about cities that are taking action on climate change. Where are they located, their geographic coordinates, what initiatives they participate in, their population, their area. We're gonna be adding also a lot of geospatial information to this data set in our next update of the Climactor package. So stay tuned for that. But this is a map of more than 12,000 cities where we can find that they're pledging different types of climate actions. So they're signed up to Michael Bloomberg's Global Covenant of Mayors of Climate and Energy. They're participating in the We Are Still In movement or America's All In movement that was started during the 2016 um, national administration that pulled out from the Paris Agreement. And um, so despite all of these cities, we could only find data where these cities are actually reporting to platforms like CDP, formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project, or to these initiatives themselves, their baseline emissions or their inventory emissions or monitoring data that, that says, OK, we have one inventory, but then uh, two years later, we measured again. And these are our emissions to know whether or not we're achieving these goals. So there's a lot of gaps. And if and if I can also mention most of the action is happening in Europe, you're probably noticed this density of these circles here in Europe. And we have this inset here where you can see most of these cities are pledging in Europe. So most of the data is also coming from Europe. If we talk about the Global South, we are missing a lot of data from, in particular, Global South actors. And so I had the pleasure of being one of the um, uh, one of 11 experts that served last summer on this National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, Medicine. We actually had a couple climate change AI presenters share their work during our consultation to develop this consensus study. And what we concluded is that we have to be looking more towards hybrid approaches, which include integration of machine learning approaches to fill in these greenhouse gas emissions gaps, because we're not gonna be able to actually make solid decisions. Going back to that mantra, you can't manage what you don't measure. We can't make solid decisions if we don't know whether um, emissions are actually coming down as a result of our policy. So I just pulled out a couple of the conclusions and recommendations from this study, which was a call to governments around the world that we need to be looking into the potential of hybrid approaches to get us more granular, temporal, and more uh, yeah, spatial, more spatially detailed data with source level information, and particularly for cities, states, and provinces to help them manage their emissions. So uh, for countries, it, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it, and, and those techniques have been pretty well developed. But in particular, for the subnational scale, we don't have a lot of really great data, and cities are really struggling, particularly in the global south, to be able to report this data in a timely manner. And so what we've done is we've developed a machine learning model to actually predict likely emissions and likely emissions trajectories of cities. And we started in Europe because simply, we all know in machine learning that you have to have training data in order to train these models. And because most of the data is coming from Europe, that's where we decided to start as a first proof of concept. And so what we did is we collected all of the data that is self-reported from these European cities. So we had more than 8,000 data points. And for those of you who are in computer science, you're probably laughing and saying, that is not a lot of data. I completely agree with you, but we have to start somewhere. And in policy, this is what I deal with every day, where I have all these great policy questions when it comes to climate change, and I don't have the data to actually measure it. And so that's why I looked towards machine learning to try to fill in some of these gaps. So we were able to scrape the data from that self-reported by these cities, collate it together in a database. And then we actually spatialized all this data. So we assigned all of these point data points that were reported to spatial boundaries. And then we could extract a bunch of existing globally, um, globally available uh, data sets. So that would include things like um, GDP that's derived from nighttime lights data, air pollution that's also derived from satellite remote sensing, fossil fuel-based CO2 emissions. Some of you may be familiar with the ODIAC uh, database that's uh, maintained by Tom Oda, and uh, we can get some CO2 information from large point sources. 
We can also get population. There are gridded population data sets that are globally available and also heating degree and cooling degree data. So this, again, not a lot. I've seen machine learning models that have like hundreds of different variables, but we really wanted to strike a balance of what um, the science also says contributes to a city's greenhouse gas emissions. But there are a lot of things that are still missing, like building electricity consumption and usage, for example, and transport related emissions. So the PM 2.5 is meant to be a proxy for that. Uh, but we, we wanted to start uh, with the, a core set of, of variables that we knew would be related to city CO2 emissions. And then we trained a machine learning model. So you can see some of the feature importance. So what were the variables that proved to contribute the most to explaining uh, uh, emissions and predicting emissions from our city? So probably no surprise, these fossil fuel CO2 emissions, population, heating, PM 2.5, and it kind of falls off from there. So this is what our predictions look like. And so, um, again, most of you who are very familiar with machine learning probably says, oh, well, you know, you have an R squared of, of 0.91. But this is, again, uh, looking at a lot of the, uh, the, the uh, training data. And so how does this perform when it comes to the, uh, the test data? And so it gets a little bit shakier there because, you know, you can see some countries like Ukraine, it's not really that great at predicting the cities, but we can get pretty reasonable prediction from using an XG, XG boost model. We tried a bunch of different algorithms. You can see the paper, it's open source below to look into more details of what we tried and the model validation. Um, but what I think is particularly useful about this type of approach is then we can get annual predicted emissions values, and then we can start to look at trends. And so that's particularly evident for Tolosa in Spain and the second panel, I don't know if you can see my cursor, and also for London. And so that's, that's what we're really interested in from a policy perspective. So I think a lot of people are going to quibble and they're going to say, well, the absolute value may not necessarily be comparable with what London itself reports and or what these other cities report. But um, I think the most important thing that, that we're interested in from a policy perspective is really the trend. So we can get a sense of, okay, are they reducing emissions? Are they actually increasing emissions? You know, we're not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good here because that's what's really relevant. We want to be able to derive some sort of signal, which we currently cannot get if cities are not reporting any data or they're only reporting one data point. So I think that's really some of the value of what we did here. Um, and then, you know, we, we played around with some of the data. So in, in policy, we like to develop regression models and do things like um, interrupted time series to say, okay, well, if there's a policy intervention, so if we look at where these red lines, these red dotted lines are, this is when the city signed up to join one of these initiatives, did that impact their emissions trajectory at all? And so this is only looking at the cities that are participating. So we're not comparing them with um, cities that did not participate. But I think the trends, as you can see with these blue lines, are pretty interesting. So we can see that um, over here on the right, time since joining the EU COM, they did experience a slight 0.16% annual percentage reduction in emissions after they joined. And I think what was also interesting about this is that those that are reporting their emissions, so they actually did contribute a mitigation inventory, they're achieving more reductions compared to cities that are participating, but then not reporting. So they're kind of, I guess, lazy, or I forgot exactly the term. They said like participating cities, maybe just like signatory cities, and then um, cities that are not participating at all. So I think that also gives us some indication that if they are actually signing up to these initiatives, that they are having some effect and helping them reduce their emissions. And but in particular, if they're actually reporting on the inventories, that's an even stronger indication of whether or not they're actually reducing their emissions. Um, and then we did extrapolate the model to all other uh, around nine, I think like 90,000 European local administrative units. So you can see that on the right to really get a sense of emissions um, trends in cities that are not participating, but you know, we can quibble and, and dive into the details of some of the limitations here. But what we generally found is that 74% of the cities here on the left that are participating have likely reduced their emissions, but then 50, uh, compared to 53% um, here on the, on the right of cities that have not been participating, but likely have reduced due to uh, yeah, other efforts that they're taking on energy efficiency or they're following national policies or directives that re are requiring them to reduce emissions, increase energy efficiency. Um, so uh, just a couple, this is a summary slide. I'm happy to share my slides too with folks um, after this call because I know I'm kind of rushing through them at lightning speed, but I just like a couple of things to highlight. As I mentioned, those cities that are reporting their emissions are likely um, actually reducing them and reducing them more compared to those that are not. 
Um, you know, but then I think also the, the larger question is sta- establishing causality. You know, there might be other factors that are explaining why these cities are reducing emissions that couldn't necessarily be tied to their participation in the European Covenant of Mayors. Uh, but then I think also this last conclusion, it seems that heavier CO2 emitters do recognize that the, their emissions are a problem and self-select in. So these are just some of the, the um, concluding findings and some of the limitations. I'm going to take a breath, but then I'm going to speed right in because I only have about 15 minutes left for the last two case studies, but I do think they're shorter. Okay, so so case two is um, predicting impacts. So um, study cities and this intersection of urbanization with climate change. And as we know, one of the great puzzles is the fact that cities, there are solutions to climate change, as we just saw from the previous case studies, but they also contribute to climate change. And one of the ways they do that is by converting generally forested landscapes, agricultural pasture lands into built surfaces that are more impervious and that actually are hotter than their rural surroundings. And that's called the urban heat island effect. And so to be able to measure this and the impact that people living in cities are exposed to higher potential levels of heat and heat stress, we need to have good weather station data that measures air temperature, relative humidity, wind speed. Um, and, And also we need to understand within an urban area how these local um, climate conditions and urban heat exposure may vary across different areas and according to different land covers, land types and services if we want to better protect people. So it's a it's a I think a, a not as well known fact, but in the United States, heat actually kills more people than other natural disasters combined. And yet it gets very little attention. FEMA, for example, has not identified heat or extreme heat as a natural disaster. And uh, it's because under the Stafford Act, which defines and gives FEMA its mandate to then allocate funding to different natural disasters like hurricanes and other natural events, uh, heat is not actually included. So it's vastly underfunded. I have not been able to get any funding for any of this research on heat. I think I've gotten rejected now from 10 different um, grant proposals because, and so I just kind of do this work in my in my spare time. Um, so looking at the uh, temperature anomalies, so these are mean temperature anomalies compared to a 1901 to 2000 baseline. This is one of the standard ways that scientists are measuring uh, temperature anomalies. So how much warmer temperatures are on average compared to what they were during this baseline period. So this is data that I collated from um, NOAA. And you can see that um, uh, all of these recent years, so 2016, 2020, I actually don't have data from this past year, but we know that in June and July, there were the hottest months on record ever. And this is ba- these are trends that have been consistently happening um, since, since yeah, temperature measurements consistently became available. And uh, whereas you can see in the 50s, where maybe our parents are um, were, can remember it was, you know, not typical to have, uh, you know, high temperature anomalies and, and, and warmer than on than average days um, in summer months in particular. But but ever since, it's just kind of become more commonplace that you're going to have um, uh, above average and, and typically warmer days than our parents or our grandparents' generation experienced. And heat has really dominated the headlines this past summer. So I just, it took me like a minute to put together this slide, just picking out some of the headlines from this summer. So extreme weather, climate change could bring year round heat waves and you have record breaking summers, Phoenix, Memphis, Houston. And of course that's been linked to a lot of the wildfires that we've been experiencing. And that's also led to air pollution. You know, I moved from Asia back to North Carolina, to the U.S., Uh, a few years ago. And part of the reason was I had young kids and wanted to protect them from air pollution. And there were many days where I had to put masks on my kids and their daycares and their schools didn't allow them to go outside because air pollution has also become much higher uh, due to wildfire events that are again linked to rising temperatures. Uh, But then in cities, we know that that people don't live uh, unidimensionally in cities. And this heat, what my research has found, is actually not distributed the same way throughout urban areas. This is a scene from Johnny Miller, who's an incredible photographer. Definitely check out his website, Unequal Scenes. And he's documented inequality within urban areas all around the world and cities all around the world. So this is Mexico City. You can see juxtaposing a much poorer neighborhood on the left and this informal soccer pitch is this really nice uh, suburban area over here on the right with these really nice sports facilities. And I think one thing that you can see right away is the differential in tree cover and green space on the right. And that absolutely leads to uh, cooling. Um, this is this is a, a picture of Los Angeles. You can kind of see some of the same patterns of inequality here. 
Um, and in a project, I'm not going to talk about this project today, but you're welcome to go to this link here, datadrivenlab.org slash urban, where we're actually measuring these inequalities along um, a range of environmental indicators on a neighborhood scale, city by city. You can see here on the left, um, this is Los Angeles, uh, neighborhood income much higher in some of these neighborhoods. This is Santa Monica in this dark green. So over $90,000 per person compared to light blue where you have neighborhoods where people living have incomes around $30,000 or less per person. And that translates to much less tree cover. So over 70% in this Santa Monica neighborhood, but then over here in this other neighborhood that's in downtown Los Angeles, less than 5%. And that translates to huge disparities in heat exposure because trees provide shade, they provide cooling. And uh, in some studies have shown that, that under the shade, you can perceive temperatures as much as five to seven degrees um, Fahrenheit cooler than in non-shaded areas. And so using satellite remote sensing data, what we found across cities all across the United States, we're finding that cities are burdening communities of color and also people living in poverty with higher levels of urban heat than their white or wealthier counterparts. And this is not just in cities that were historically redlined. One of my missions in talking about climate change justice and disproportionate exposure is to remind people that this is not just due to redlining, actually in cities that were not redlined. So that's part of this 97%. We're still seeing disproportionate exposure for communities of color and people living below the poverty line. And so it's a, it's a larger systemic problem all across the United States. Um, and so to, to get a better sense of this, um, these disproportionate burdens where we need to have better data to really understand, okay, well, um, ex precisely within urban areas, uh, are there interventions like tree planting, or if we increase albedo, the surface reflectance by coating certain roadways or building facades here in Singapore, on National University of Singapore's campus, I learned that they're doing uh, digital twins and actually um, painting some of the building facades white in these digital models, and then measuring the impact of uh, those um, interventions on urban heat island and on temperatures in urban areas. It's incredible. I've actually learned a lot since I've been here the last few days. Um, but in, uh, in Chapel Hill and Raleigh Durham, we don't yet have a digital twin model. And so what we did is we sent students out with these handheld pocket lab sensors that can collect by the, the second uh, temperature, air temperature, and also relative humidity. And you can see the different routes that we mapped in five neighborhoods at the town of Chapel Hill helped us identify as being particularly vulnerable to heat stress. And then, uh, yeah, you can see the, the data that they collected and really huge disparities we saw in terms of um, predicted air temperature and also relative humidity at different times of day. So you can see in Franklin Street where the campus is, uh, you know, much higher, you know, you can see, yeah, differences here um, between the afternoon and also the 5 to 6 p.m and not as much difference here in university place. So that's also pretty worrisome because you'd like to see more of a difference as the day goes on and evening comes um, to allow for bodies to recover. And so just as a, as a note, this is in Celsius. So actually I should have presented it in uh, Fahrenheit because the map over here is in Fahrenheit, but you can see in some areas, particularly in the Franklin Street area, we, were met, we had our participants, our citizen volunteers measure temperatures as high as 108 degrees Fahrenheit. And that was a day that the one weather station um, in Chapel Hill was, was only measuring about 94 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, there's a lot of reasons why the temperatures that we collected and measured are much hotter, but, but in short, um, in building surfaces, road surfaces, those all radiate heat back up. I'm sure over the summer, as you've been walking across the parking lot, you can feel some of that mean radiant temperature, that heat that's radiating off the pavement that also affects local te temperature and also your perception of thermal comfort and heat stress. Um, so we combined, and I'm kind of rushing here, but just to let you know, we combined um, other inputs on land cover, satellite remote sensing, high resolution aerial imagery, trained a random forest regression model to then be able to develop these high resolution maps of air temperature, relative humidity, and also heat stress here. And so you can see this is much more detailed data that then we can give to policymakers and so they can better understand where people might be the most vulnerable to heat stress. And in the event of a prolonged heat wave or um, high temperatures where they might want to particularly um, invest in interventions or um, social support systems or cooling centers or alert local emergency um, healthcare workers that these are areas that they may particularly want to pay attention. Um, okay, so that I'm just going to skip through the next slide, but to go to the last one, because I think I only have um, maybe five minutes left 
for this last case. So here is where we're using text data to evaluate trends, patterns, and also understand the relationship between policies and actual climate mitigation performance. So the policy challenge here is that a lot of the data, particularly when we talk about climate change topics like resilience and adaptation, are frequently found in text forms. They're in PDFs, they're in policy documents, they're in websites and news releases, or in uh, white papers. And so... Um, we need to, to have a better way to actually analyze this content that's not requiring students or my team to then go and, and manually code a lot of this information. And so I'm going to just go, these are actually from my uh, data science class. And so where I teach this topic, but basically um, large volume of text is now available, but it's cumbersome to manually read and code. So computers, so there's now an emerging, particularly in the social sciences, we're now stealing these techniques from computer science and uh, applying them to text and, and using text as data in order to be able to make sense of these trends and their relationship with policy outcomes. And so they can come in the form of speeches, social media posts, online reviews, congressional records, laws and policies, keyword searches. I put a lot of cat memes in my um data science lectures to try to keep my students awake, but they tell me that cat memes are no longer cool. So, but anyways, I decided to leave it here. Um, so one of the, the um, methods that we use is structural topic modeling. And this is a semi-supervised uh, classification technique that allows users to discover topics. So you don't come a priori with a set of topics like you would with manual coding and then look in the text for evidence of a particular set of themes, but you actually allow for the algorithms to discover topics for you. And with structural topic modeling, you can add covariates like GDP or emissions, or in my case, I look at different actor types along with these models to then understand patterns and how different topics might vary with different uh, covariates, such as uh, I just mentioned here. And then the output is that it models documents as distributions of topics. So it's not saying, oh, well, this uh, Sydney, Australia, their climate policies only talk about energy efficiency. It's actually telling you the likelihood that the Sydney's climate strategy talks about the energy efficiency versus transport versus buildings versus citizens. And then the topics themselves are distributions of words. So the result is that we can take, and so we collected in this one study I did with my student, Ross, uh, we, we collected uh, more than 4,000 city level documents and uh, climate disclosures that companies reported to the CDP. We collected country level NDCs. So we had about 9,000 actors documents and we were able to apply this technique and discover these 30 topics here. So we found that these um, climate actors were frequently talking about consumption or energy savings, waste and transport, employee travel. So these were the topics that we identified. And you can see the probability of these different topics uh, reflecting these words that are reflected in these bar charts. And we can then also look at how these different topics vary and how likely certain actors are to actually uh, reflect these topics in their strategies. So one thing that I found really interesting is that climate change adaptation here in light blue is most likely to be found in a country's NDC. And that's because most of the countries that are participating in the UN and the Paris Agreement are actually developing countries or least developed countries. And so because everybody has to report on what they're doing on climate change, they're much more likely to talk about uh, climate change adaptation than they are some of these other topics. Like you can see for companies in this light blue, they talk about offsets, they talk about natural gas, boilers, fuel efficiency. So this is a demonstration of what can be done. And because I'm really running out of time, I'm gonna skip through some of these other slides and go to just talk about the next evolution of this tech space work, which is a new project that we will launch during Climate Week in New York, which I think is happening September 19th. And uh, we'll have a press release that goes out and then officially we'll have an event on September 22nd. So if you're gonna be in New York, please let me know. I will not be there. I'm saving the carbon, but my colleague, James Jung from Arboretica is going to be there to talk about this. But we are developing a fine-tuned specific large language model to help demystify net zero commitments. And this is an extension from another project that I don't have time to talk about, but it's called the Net Zero Tracker, where we are actually using students to evaluate the credibility of 4,000 actors, including the Forbes 2000 companies, the credibility and the robustness of their decarbonization goals, because there's a lot of greenwashing going on. And the reason why we naturally evolved to want to do this project is because we started to play around with ChatGPT and other 
large language models that are out there like BARD. And we started to ask them, okay, well, can you use fossil fuels if you're planning to decarbonize, which actually a Pew poll found that two thirds of Americans think that you actually can. So that's part of the problem. We wanted to know who's actually doing really um, credible work on net zero and who's actually pledging. Can you use offsets? So these are all questions that we've asked large language models, chatbots that are out there. And we were incredibly disappointed with the results. So here's an example. If we ask if an entity relies on fossil fuels, does that mean it's not pledging net zero credibly? If you ask GPT-4, it will say yes. I think this question is phrased a little bit uh, funny, but it should be, does it mean it's not pledging? So it should say, does it mean it is pledging net zero credibly? So chat net zero says it is not pledging net zero credibly. It gives the source, it tells the page number. Um, chat climate, which is another project, I think from ETH Zurich, they also say no similarly, but uh, the the um, you can check, take a look at the results, may, may not be as specific. Um, and then here, if we ask, what is Walmart's net zero target and do they report scope three emissions? Um, it looks like GPT-4 does a little bit better on that. Um, it looks like chat climate does not, but we provide um, a lot more domain specific details on chat net zero. And then here, if you say, tell me about the climate targets of Amazon, Walmart, the US, Afghanistan, and Nepal, a real smorgasbord of different actors. It looks like chat zero provides more accurate and updated answers than GPT-4 and even chat report where you can upload PDFs than the, the um, output of chat net zero. So we're trying to um, improve upon these other tools out there. We have uh, designed an active hallucination checking algorithm to make sure that results are not hallucinated and are not fake. We wanna allow in the next phase for users to self upload documents. So you can say, oh, I have Microsoft's latest corporate social responsibility report and climate strategy. I wanna know how that compares with other big tech companies. And we wanna be able to live connect to the internet to allow for searching of the most updated information. So you can sign up at chatnetzero.ai for a beta release, um, but this is really exciting work. Love to have feedback from this community. I think that's super important to have people. So we are planning, I think the week before the 19th to allow for beta users that sign up to help us test the tool, let us know how it works, give us the hardest questions you can about climate change. We wanna know how Chat Net Zero does so that we can make it a tool for everybody to be able to actually get accurate information that's up to date about what everyone is doing because we all need to hold these actors accountable and there's so much greenwashing going out there. And I think that's the reason why GPT-4 is producing a lot of uh, inaccurate data because you know it's in companies' best interest to provide a lot of potentially false uh, information. Okay, so, that is it. I'm sorry I had to speed through at the end, um, but it's hard when you ask a professor to give a short talk because we have a tendency to uh, talk a lot. So, uh, but thank you so much. And I really look forward to your questions. Yeah, thanks for this uh, great presentation. Um, so I'm gonna see, look at the questions. Um, I mean, you now mentioned already um, large language models. Um, so how do you think the latest progress in large language models will change the policy space? I think it's huge. I, I think it's absolutely going to be transformative. And so I work really closely with a lot of policymakers, particularly the UNFCCC secretariat. And I just, I mean, they really struggle. They really struggle with getting basic data and they, they, keep, they keep wanting to engage um, different people and civil society in this process. And their solution is upload a PDF to a portal that's very hard to use. <laughs> and, uh, and then, so they collect thousands of these submissions. They've done it many, many times and they did it with this last global stock take and it's nearly impossible to make sense of any of it. So I have no idea because they have 10 different pages. They have over a thousand submissions from different organizations about um, what they think the UNFCCC should do about climate change and how they can improve the next round of NDCs. And, and there's just no way to analyze it. So I really do think that this is groundbreaking technology that can really help. And we're already seeing, I mean, just the numbers of users that are using BARD and ChatGPT have just been exploding month on month. And I mean, we had a seminar at the beginning of the semester. What do we do with ChatGPT in the classroom? So I think it fundamentally is changing how we interact with information, how we acquire data. And I think it's just going to be huge in the climate policy space. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next one is also always a good one. If you got a team of a dozen people and all the resources you required for five years to build some climate AI tool, what would you build? 
chat net zero. <laughs> I need help. I don't have any funding for it. This first pilot I funded just personally for my own um, money because I, and yeah, it was just literally like uh, giving my friend James at Arboretica, you know, a little bit of, of funding and, and because we believe so strongly in it. And we just think that if we don't do it, someone else is going to do it and it's probably not going to be as credible. And we have the benefit, you know, like I'm not a computer scientist, I'm a climate scientist policy person. And so uh, we've been looking and, and developing the standards and the definitions and, and, and looking at this stuff for a really long time. And so we really um, know how, how to get credible information, how to really vet it. And with the net zero tracker, we have an accurate labeled data set that has been vetted, it has been verified. We're using that as an initial training input into chat net zero. I just, you know, need to get funding. I, yeah. So if there are people who want to contribute to this project, that's a hundred percent what I would do uh, because, and I, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait five years. I mean, I'm trying to do this now. I have no funding, but I'm doing this now because I just feel so strongly in the fact that we need to really understand um, how large language models can help in this space, can help understand, decipher, and it can help policymakers, frankly, um, yeah, like be, uh, help people and hold people to account, hold corporations to account. So this was the the topic of the last COP. The UN um, convened this high level expert working group on net zero. And last June in Bonn, they they announced this accountability and recognition framework. And data is at the centerpiece, and also the need for all these different actors to submit transition plans. And I think this is going to be a huge data problem, uh, and, and it's going to be frankly, um, impossible for them to really make sense of and, and analyze if they don't have a technology like Chen at zero or a large language model to help them decipher what is going on, who's doing what, what's not happening, and whether or not um, people are doing actually credible climate action. Yeah, also awesome. Thanks. To which extent uh, can machine learning support policy development in developing countries? That is also a major motivation for why I'm doing this work. Um, so I did uh, a lot of work and, and lived in and out of China for a really long time. And, and through my work at WRI, just seeing the appetite to want to do something on climate change, to, to be a responsible global contributor to the solution, but then lacking the tools and capacity and the, and the financial resources, frankly, to be able to do it. So in the first round of the sustainable what, the, the development goals, they were called the Millennium Development Goals. The only way they could actually produce data from developing countries was by getting the developed countries to funnel money. I don't know if I said developed or I meant developing. Developing countries to build the capacity to collect data. And frankly, that's way too slow. That's way too slow. That takes decades to try to build up that capacity. You have to find the money. And so I, that's where I really think machine learning can help us achieve the speed and the scale that we need to get the capacity built as quickly as possible to get data in the hands of people who really need it. And so that's where I think um, machine learning can really help. So that global emission or that emissions model that I presented as the first case, we're now expanding globally. We have a partnership with Google's Environmental Insights Explorer, where they've used Google Maps data, buildings, and also transport data to help estimate city level emissions from these various sources. So we have a partnership with them to also incorporate their data uh, to help predict um, emissions trends and performance in a developing country cities. So I think it can be absolutely transformative uh, for a lot of these countries and help them leapfrog, frankly, because you know, do they necessarily need to build a lot of the same data infrastructure and architecture that is incredibly costly, that also requires resources to maintain and requires a lot of human resources to help uh, interpret I think if we can apply some of these techniques, um, then that can help them uh, immediately. That that can help them leapfrog over some of these challenges that we've um, struggled. We've seen other cities and other businesses struggle in, in other contexts. Yeah, thanks. I, I see some re-ranking of questions going on here. Okay, so the, this one has uh, uh, gone up now. Are there instances where machine learning predictions have led to actionable policy changes or interventions related to climate issues? Yes, that's a really great question. Um, I mean, I think that's really the million dollar question and why I think this community is so important to continue to engage with the policy communities. Because honestly, there's a concept in the public administration and the governance literature that I interact with sometimes called policy analytical capacity. And in some of the work that I've done, I've identified that as being one of the main barriers to actually having more of this integration of use of machine learning 
and the these modeling and, and data prediction techniques into the policy space. And that was also what we identified as part of this National Academy of Sciences report is that often policymakers, they don't have the capacity to really understand um, what these models actually do. There's a huge well-known black box problem with machine learning. And so there's a lot of lack of trust. I mean, even when I was working with the Chinese government in 2008, when I started my PhD, it was a major concern. They said, well, yeah, we can't use satellite remote sensing data because it's not considered official data. And we don't necessarily understand all the assumptions that go into developing these numbers. And it's the same thing with machine learning, where there's a lot of, I think, um, lack of understanding, there's a lot of opacity, mistrust and misinformation. And I think uh, we need scientists like you all, researchers like you all in this community to actually communicate, okay, well, this is what the model is doing. This is where it can actually help answer your policy question. And this is where it may not be as good. And this is where there are some limitations. But then also on the flip side, we need to have the policymakers feel comfortable approaching the scientists and say, look, I have these questions. This is where the knowledge gaps are. This is where I don't have data. Can you actually help me? And um, we've been trying to do that with this community that I convened uh, with the support of the Carnegie Corporation the last two years called the Climate Action Data 2.0 Community. We've actually brought together policymakers, businesses, these networks of non-state actors and digital technologists. So many of you have also participated in these monthly working group meetings just so we can have these conversations. And on that September 22nd event, we will also produce um, our, what we're calling the catalog because it's CAD, C-A-D, Climate Action Data where we are trying to archive all these examples of digital approaches to solving climate issues. So we would love to feature your projects. If you have a project that you think would be really relevant to these policy communities, please email me because we are collecting these examples. We wanna feature these case studies because that single-handedly is the feedback I've heard from policy communities of where, the, where they need help. They, they don't even know, they have no idea. I mean, literally when the UN first launched its non-state actor platform. It was formerly called NASCA. Now it's called the Global Climate Action Platform. And they asked me to analyze the data. They approached me before Paris. They said, we really want you to analyze the data. We don't want this to be a greenwashing exercise. I said, great, just give me access to your API. They looked at me and they said, what is an API? And I said, oh boy, <laughs> we have a problem. And I had to literally scrape all the data from their website because they didn't have an API and they had no way of getting, giving me the data. So that just tells you about the capacity challenges, the, the analytical um, capacity challenges that many policymakers and governments face. So I think um, opening those lines of communication, don't be afraid to approach them to also uh, on our side, we need to be really transparent. We need to say, okay, these, you know, like I showed the feature importance tables and in all of our papers, you know, you have to be really, really transparent because there's so much black box stuff going out there when it comes to machine learning. And that's frankly not going to help policymakers. I think we also need to demystify that. We need to be a, a lot more transparent and provide all the details of everything that goes in and then also be transparent about the limitations. I think that's also really important. Yes, thank you. Um, and if you collected some success stories, feel free to also uh, write a blog post for CCAI or something. Oh, I would love that. I would absolutely, I, yeah, I can absolutely write Be, a, Because uh, we are post. always, of yeah, course, are also looking for such uh, success stories. Um, looking at the time, maybe a last one, maybe that you can answer maybe in the last minute or so. Um, so it's also going a little bit into this critical direction. So what are the things that machine learning is not good for or should take a back seat with respect to policy? Maybe that's a good finishing question. Yeah, that is a really good question. Well, I kind of alluded to some of the challenges previously. I think that um, there are times when as, uh, as computer scientists or as engineers, there's a lot of over-engineering of a solution where there definitely is a much more parsimonious, you know, we think about, I think it's like, is it Moore's law where, or Occam's razor, Occam's razor is probably the, the better one, Occam's razor where it is um, often the simpler solution that is more frequently the answer, because I think in machine learning, there's a tendency to say, we're gonna throw everything into the model and, and let the algorithm determine what's most important. But I think for policymakers, that's often not that helpful because then they get very confused or it's decision makers can get very confused in terms of, okay, well, what then can I actually do to affect the problem? It doesn't help when you have a hundred different variables and then you assign different probabilities and say, okay, well, you know, maybe it's this policy or this action that contributed to this result. 
they need a lot more clarity to say, okay, this is what I should do. And this is how much it's going to cost me. And I, I, have a, I, I think on the engineering side, there tends to be too much engineering because we're like, oh, this is like really sexy. And, and look at this computing prowess that I have, and I can do all these like amazing things. And that's great. But then you have to find some way to actually distill it into actionable insights for decision makers. If you want those data or those outputs to actually be used. And I think that often there's there's a disconnect because it gets too complicated and the models get get overly engineered. And so then it becomes really, really difficult to then just say, okay, this is what I want to want to do. And even you know, before machine learning, um, I was managing a project where we were developing um, aggregated indices for for policymakers, and it called the Environmental Performance Index. And it was the same feedback that we got. It's like, okay, you've got sixty seven indicators in this index, but I don't know how I can beat Finland. That's all they wanted to know. They're like, I want if I'm Norway, I want to be better than Finland. <laughs> you know? It's like, okay, well, because they, they're not going to do 76 different things. They want to know like the top three things that I can do. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I could listen uh, more and I guess there are more people also, but we had time. So um, that's why let's wrap it up. Um, so thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for attending this webinar. Um, the next one will be on September 19th. It will be on material discovery, of course, using um, machine learning in the climate context. Um, also, just want to let you know, there's the New Rips workshop, uh, Tackling Climate Change with AI again on December 16th, and submissions are still open until September 29th. So if any of you has some work they want to share, uh, check out uh, if you want to submit something. Um, yeah, you, you find this all on our website at climatechange.ai. Um, so yeah, thanks again uh, to you, Angel, and thanks to everybody who has been here, um, and see you maybe at one of the next webinars. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and for everyone uh, staying tuned.